most of you, but uh, I'm uh, Jacques Cremer, and uh, uh, behind me you can see the wonderful new TSC building where I hope I can uh, we can see all of you pretty soon. Uh, this seminar is actually an initi initiative of uh, uh, Julian uh, Wright and uh, André, who's going to be speaking. And uh, TSC is very happy to uh, uh, provide the, the physical hosting, but uh, Julian and André really launched it and uh, they are responsible, they are uh, co-chairing the scientific committee and they are responsible for everything that goes wrong. Uh, the seminar will uh, uh, meet uh, once every two weeks uh, up to the summer and we still have to decide what we are doing afterwards. We are thinking about once every three weeks after the summer if uh, things become uh, more normal, but uh, no, we will decide and we hope that we will have feedback from you. Um, I won't go uh, very long. The program uh, is on, in construction, is on the website. Uh, if you've got questions which are of a scientific uh, nature, you write to uh, Andre or uh, Julian who will uh, share them with the scientific committee. Uh, things which are uh, administrative, like the mailing list and so on, you uh, discuss with uh, Marie-Hélène Dufour, uh, whose uh, address is on the, the website or uh, with me. And uh, please uh, don't hesitate to send us any comments about things which uh, went uh, badly. We also like to know about things which uh, uh, went well. Okay, so in every, uh, for, for every um, session, we will have both a speaker um, and, uh, and, and an administrator of a session. And, uh, uh, Alex uh, de Cornier is playing the role today, so uh, I leave Alex to explain the rules of the seminar and so on. And now you won't hear about me again. Okay, Jacques, so now I mute you. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Alex de Cornier. So um, just a, a couple of things um, that I want to warn you about. So first thing is that this seminar will be recorded. Um, and so, I will, uh, the way it's gonna work, I mean, I guess it's, uh, we're still experimenting, but so I'm the moderator. So if you have any questions, um, I guess you can either use the chat um, and then I'll pick, uh, uh, I'll ask the questions when relevant. And uh, I mean, I'll, I'll do my best, or you can raise your hand and, and from time to time, I'll, I'll give you the, um, I'll give you the floor. Um, so if, if that's okay, so we're very happy to have André uh, as you for the, the first uh, seminar today, um, talking about data enable, enabled learning network effects and competitive advantage. André, can you share your screen? Absolutely. And there okay. we go, can, every, can everyone see it? Cool. Alex, should I get started? Yes. Please. Okay, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever the case may be to everyone, which is a very uh, interesting uh, uh, format. Um, as Alex mentioned, so what I'm going to do, I'll try to, start to pause maybe like every two or three slides and you know, just, just to give some time if people have clarifying questions during the presentation. Just a reminder, the idea is 40 minutes presentation of course, with, uh, with some interruptions for questions. But then, uh, and we're hoping to have the last 20 minutes for more substantive Q&A. All right, so this is a paper with, joined with Julian Wright, who's also somewhere in the background. And um, it's called Data Enabled Learning, Network Effects and Competitive Advantage. The background for this is um, relatively straightforward. We all know that there's an increasing number of products and services these days. Um, that are gathering customer data and they're relying on that data to improve, their, to improve those products and services. Um, the underlying reasons are pretty clear. Uh, again, there's lots, of, so there's more and more digitization even of traditional consumer products and services. So of course this is true for software, but it's also true for hardware products and even more traditional like apparel and other types of products all of which now are connected in some shape or form through cloud-based services. And that enables them to enables the providers of these products to gather customer data and you know, use that customer data to, to improve the products. And the second, second factor that makes this possible obviously is cheaper storage and 
better algorithms, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning that enable that processing of that data to actually translate into um, improvements. So as a consequence, and I think that those are sort of the key, the key things that matter for what I'm going to talk about is that the learning from customer data has now become a key, a key in improving the, continuously improving the willingness to pay uh, for these products and services. The second aspect is that um, the learning from customer data has become very fast. I mean, learning from customer data is not necessarily new. It's been around for decades, but it used to be very slow. I think what's kind of interesting now is that uh, the cycles of learning and product improvements are very fast to the point where the product or service has actually improved during the consumption lifetime of customers. If I adopt a product, some of these products actually expect it to be improving during, my, during the time that I'm going to be consuming it. And finally, uh, because the data that is being gathered these days is, can be so fine grained, uh, the other possibility is obviously that the products are actually highly customized, that the improvements to the products and services are customized to each individual user, as opposed to just generic improvements for everyone. There's lots of examples of this. I'm not gonna go in through in detail in all of them. Uh, I'm sure there, there are many more like than what I listed, what we listed in this slide. Uh, the only thing that I wanna point out is that um, so in some of these cases, most of the learning is specific to one user. So if you take something like say smart connected devices like thermostats, fridges and so on, what really matters there for product improvement, the data that really matters is for each individual user, their own personal data. So product gets better, the more I use it, but it doesn't really matter how many other products uh, they're serving. In other cases, like say recommend recommender systems, what really matters is learning across users. And of course, for a lot of other cases, both of these play a role. So there's both across user learning and within user learning. So I want to flag this out uh, up front because this is something that, I'll, uh, that we go uh, in quite some depth uh, in the model. So key questions we're asking, uh, what does competitive advantage look like with data enabled learning when firms are competing um, in context with data enabled learning? Uh, what are the differences in outcomes when the learning is across users versus within users? And then finally, what are the conditions under which uh, this type of data enabled learning actually leads to meaningful network effects? And I put meaningful in uh, quotation marks because, I mean, some people have the view that data enabled learning itself is a form of network effect. I don't have strong, because basically it has a, this positive feedback loop. The more, uh, the more customers you serve, the better the product. I don't have strong feelings. I mean, I tend to have a stricter definition of network effects, but be that, that, that as it may, the key message that I'll, I'll get to, to uh, in the last part of the talk is that that itself is not enough for these network effects to matter. What you also need for them to matter is some sort of consumer uh, customer coordination problem, just like we have with uh, traditional network effects. So I'll talk about that in the last part. This might be maybe, uh, let me pause here for a second and see if there, Alex, if there are any, any burning questions. Alex, we can't hear you, you're on mute. No, sorry, no question. Great, audience is well behaved. I was fully expecting someone would ask like, why does your model <laughs> start asking about them? I don't, okay. Um, all right, so in terms of relationship with previous literature, I'll go relatively quickly through this. Obviously, it's related to traditional learning by doing literature, which mostly tend to focus on improve, so um, cost reductions due to serving more customers. What we're looking at is willingness, willingness to pay improvements, but that's not all, right? I mean, there's a similarity at a high level between the two, and I guess that similarity holds in the simplest version of our model, but we do have like quite a few new topics that we can explore and new results. And one thing I would emphasize here is that one nice feature of our model is that we're able to fully characterize the price dynamics, firm profits, um, and we actually can get closed form solutions and we can do some nice comparative statics on the shape of the learning functions. And that's in addition to exploring some topics which are not uh, traditionally explored by learning by doing literature. Uh, we obviously borrow, so we're, it's somewhat related to literature on network effects. We borrow like uh, the notion of, of consumer beliefs and coordination issues. Uh, switching costs in the sense that uh, when you have wither, within user learning in our model, that creates uh, an endogenous switching cost. 
And there's also a number of actually recent papers that do look, you know, more or less specifically at data at for at different forms of data enabled learning. Uh, again, I'll, I won't go into the detail. Um, I think the key this, the the key differentiation of our paper, I think, as far as we know, it's the first one first one to very to have a very explicit dynamic model in which both firm choices or so firm strategic choices like pricing and consumer uh, decisions are explicitly modeled. Uh, I mean, there's some topics that these papers study that we don't and vice versa. There are certain topics that we look into like distinction between within user learning and across user learning that are that are we think are novel. Um, again, if no questions, then I will go into I will go into the model. So I'll start with the model with across user learning only. Um, there are two firms incumbent and entrance uh, and they're competing in prices over infinitely many periods. Uh, there's a discount factor, uh, firms, the two firms have the same marginal costs, and again, they compete in prices, they set prices every period. Uh, there's a continuum of atomistic identical consumers of measure uh, one in every period. And you can think of these consumers as being either the same consumers in every period, but they can costlessly switch. So they, they can make a certain choice in let's say period T and then a period T plus one, if they want, they can switch from one firm to the other, but with no exogenous switching cost. Or they can also be new consumers in every period. Uh, either way works and the, 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 the solutions are the, are the same in this model with the cross user learning. Things are gonna be different with, with, uh, when we go to within user learning. Um, and again, in every period, the consumers decide which firm to buy from. And so the key feature, obviously, of the model is uh, how we model utility uh, derived by consumers. And we're trying to make it as simple as possible. Um, the utility offered by firm I is made up of two components. Uh, there's SI, which you can think of as a standalone value of the product or service for firm I. And then there's the learning component. And the learning component takes the form of an increasing function of NI, which is the total number of customers that firm, firm I has served in the past. Uh, just a couple, a couple notes here. So because uh, there's a measure N equal one of, of consumers in every period, and because we assume Bertrand competition in every period, in every period, one firm is gonna win all consumers. So therefore the number of past customers that each individual firm wins is exactly equal to the number of past periods that each firm has won in the past. Uh, and then uh, the, the other note is we're going to assume that the learning function is capped at NI bar. What that means is basically there's a certain number, uh, past a certain number of total customers that have been served. There's a, there's a maximum learning threshold that is being reached and the fir firm I cannot pass that threshold. Uh, so basically like, you know, the, the learning plateaus, you've learned everything you can, you can learn and then the utility stays constant after that. Uh, we can actually like relax this assumption as, as I'll uh, mention uh, in a couple of slides. So just to, you know, just to, just to emphasize, we don't actually, we don't place any restrictions on the, on the learning functions FI other than the fact that they're weakly increasing. So they can be, you know, something, something like this where, you know, which is kind of intuitive. So let's say there's in, in this type of learning function, there's not, there's no learning up to a certain point, then learning is increasing and finally learning completely plateaus past uh, the threshold and I bar. All right, so in order to determine the equilibrium in this model, uh, obviously we're going to define the value functions, uh, which means the present discounted value, uh, present discounted value of profits for each individual firm, starting given the NI and NE being the starting point. So NI and NE recall are the number, um, are the number of previous periods or previous uh, customers that each, each firm, I or E, has, uh, has served in the past. So I'll show you just the easiest possible case uh, before actually like showing you the, the full results. So imagine that both firms have reached their learning thresholds, i.e. both firms have, uh, have uh, served uh, enough customers in the past to learn everything that there was to learn. Well, in this case, uh, things are very simple because now we basically have asymmetric Bertrand competition over infinite periods with just different utilities. So each firm's utility is SI plus FI of the, of the NI bar, which is the, the threshold. So obviously the firm that offers a bigger, a higher utility is gonna win in every single period. And then the value functions have the expression which is shown here, which is again, just uh, Bertrand profits in one periods over infinite many periods, so over one minus delta. 
Now, so basically this is the starting point uh, for the proof of, the, of, for the derivation of the entire equilibrium, which we do uh, using backwards induction. And in fact, it's gonna be two dimensional uh, induction in, the, um, uh, in Ni and Ne. So now if we go backwards, so if Ni and Ne are smaller than Ni bar and Ne bar, basically the, the the, the, the way this works is that uh, the, the key step, I guess, in the proof is that each firm is willing to offer a subsidy in the current period, which is going to be the difference between its future value if it wins that current period versus if it loses. Uh, and using that, you know, we can, we can iterate and use, a, again, uh, backwards induction in two dimensions to obtain uh, the following proposition. So this is the first key result in the paper. So let me just explain briefly what, uh, what it means. Um, so essentially there's a unique Markov perfect equilibrium in which uh, firm E wins in all periods if its standalone value is relative to firm I is greater than a certain threshold. And the threshold is this function delta of NI and NE, which is given here. So first of all, it's not, I mean, in some sense, it should be pretty intuitive that there's a threshold because again, the, the, the learning functions are uh, increasing. So there's this like uh, positive feedback loop. The more you win, the more likely you are to win. So if you win in this period, obviously you're going to win in the next period because you just accumulate more learning and the opponent has stayed, uh, uh, remains stuck. So it's not surprising that there's a threshold. What's interesting is the expression of the threshold. So delta of NI and NE. So you can think of this threshold as capturing firm I's competitive advantage. Why? Because the higher this threshold is, the higher the bar in some sense for, the, um, uh, for firm E to win in terms, of, in terms of its standalone utility. So if delta is higher, the standalone utility of E has to be uh, higher relative to the standalone utility of I in order for E to win. And not surprisingly, uh, delta of NI and E is increasing in NI and decreasing in, in uh, NE. So the more learning firm I has had in the past, the higher its competitive advantage. And the more learning firm E has had in the past, the, uh, the lower the competitive advantage of, um, of firm I. And the other key thing to notice here, if you divide delta of NI and NE by Y minus delta, if you look at the expression, it's actually relatively simple. It's basically the difference in present discounted values of the total surplus created by I if I was to win in every period versus E. So if I was to win in every period, then the present discounted value is going to be uh, F of FI of NI this period plus delta of F, uh, delta FI of NI plus one plus so on and so forth up to infinity. And just remembering that the, the learning caps at uh, NI bar. And then you basically take this difference between I and E and you obtain the threshold which by the way means the thres threshold is socially efficient, something that I'll come back and talk about in a couple of slides. Uh, so last remark here, um, again, all, we've done this. And so this equilibrium is unique. Uh, if you rule out uh, uh, strat so pricing strategies for both firms that are dominated off the equilibrium path. And we also have a tie breaking rule. So in that sense, the equilibrium is unique. Now you can take the results in this proposition and also the expression, the, the, the value functions for both of the firms that I'm gonna show you in the next slides. Everything holds just as well if, you, if we take the limit when the, um, the thresholds go to infinity. So we don't necessarily need the, uh, uh, we don't need the, the learning functions to be bounded. All we actually need is that they're bounded by some power function in the limit. So for example, linearly increasing learning functions works just as fine as, uh, you know, we'll, our results will go through. Let me pause here in case there are questions. Are there any questions? I'm not seeing any raised hand. But let me know in the chat if I'm just not, I'm just missing them. Yeah, take a look at the chat. Again, I'm happy to, to pause. I think this is the first time we're doing this. So we're also yeah. trying to figure out what the, the best format is here. Uh, Okay, we have a question. Why do you need the cap on N? Uh, so just, okay, so the key, the, key the, the cap on N is key in the proof. So in the proof of proposition one, we, again, so the proof is by backwards induction. So we start with the, um, the, the result is very easy when both firms have reached the threshold and we work backwards from there. Now, so if we didn't, if we didn't have the cap on N, doing the proof like directly when the, the learning functions are, is unbounded would be a little bit more difficult. Also, 
the one thing that doesn't necessarily go through when you go from bounded, uh, so bounded learning to unbounded is the uniqueness of the equilibrium. So if the two learning functions have this cap, then what I, proposition one says basically the equilibrium is unique. Once we go to infinite, I mean, the, the equilibrium is still there and works very well, but it not, it's not necessarily guaranteed that it's, it's unique. So it's mostly like a technical, technical issue. But also, I also think it's quite realistic in general, you know, learning, learning is capped. Okay, and, uh, okay, so how important is linearity in this model? There's no linearity assumed here. I, I'm not, so maybe you can ask the, the person to clarify. There's, I, I, we, we haven't really assumed any linearity, or maybe I'm misunderstanding. Gary, do you want to? Let, let me unmute you. Uh, right. I, I'll unmute you, Gary, if you want to clarify. Uh, just in, in the uh, learning function, it's linear. It's it's SI plus. Uh, oh, I F. see. All right. I think you could do. It. it becomes obviously a little bit a little bit trickier. I mean, presumably you can do something more general as long as so you can have like a function of SI end of the ni and just imposing that the um uh, it's increasing in both terms i think the interaction between the two and the function might make it slightly more complicated i think at a high level the main results will probably still be there it's just neat i guess the, the other part is like it's just neater to do it this way because you know you have this very natural threshold right so we focus at the other part is like it allows us to focus very cleanly on the learning functions, right? So you express everything as a threshold in terms of the uh, the standalone utilities relative to the um, uh, to the learning functions. Okay. Yeah. Just, um, regarding the questions, I'll, I'll prioritize the questions that are more like a clarifying questions, and yeah. you know, I, I I see some questions that are more like a discussion of related literature, so I think we should keep that for later. Okay, I trust you. So that's, that, that's great. Okay, so um, let me go. So there, there's one corollary to this result. Again, we can, we can get closed form solutions for absolutely everything. I'm not gonna show you the actual solutions. I mean, the, uh, the actual expressions for the value functions for the two firms. We just wanna focus on something that's kind of interesting. So there's basically four regions, um, depending on where the, this difference in in SE minus SI, so difference in standalone values is. So because E and I are pretty much symmetric up to now, uh, well, it's either I wins or E wins. So if you focus on the first two bullet points, which are the cases in which I wins. So there's two cases there. If SI minus SE is very low, so if E's standalone value is sufficiently low relative to I, that basically I wins and E doesn't even bother to compete very hard. So E is gonna price at costs and you know, in, in, in this case, so that's, that's the first case. Now, in the second case, when I wins, but E is sufficiently close in standalone value, then E will actually offer a subsidy in the current period because it hopes to win, right? If E wins the current period, then actually it will win the next, in the next period. And of course, it makes perfect sense that the, the, the threshold for that to happen is delta of Ni and E plus one. So if E were just to win one more period, then it could uh, potentially win. And then symmetrically for, um, uh, symmetrically when E wins. So we, you know, we can push this further and you can basically determine the number of periods uh, uh, for which the losing firm uh, will, uh, will subsidize. So if, if, uh, if the standalone value of the losing firm is very low, then the losing firm is never gonna, is never gonna offer a subsidy. So it prices its cost indefinitely. If at the opposite extreme, if the losing firm's standalone value is actually really close, so there's this range of parameters that's, you know, uh, that's, uh, that's not empty, over which basically the losing firms offers a subsidy indefinitely. So it keeps hoping to win indefinitely, even if that doesn't, that never happens. And then in between these two cases, there's a range in which the losing firm offers a subsidy for a finite number of periods, which we can actually pin down using the, um, uh, using the expressions of, the, of those thresholds. Now, perhaps a little bit more surprisingly, uh, the winning firm is actually it is possible that the winning firm may also subsidize. So for example, if the winning firm, uh, so if the winning firm is I, uh, but in the current period, the total value offered by I, so standalone value plus learning is lower than the, uh, than the current value offered by E, 
then actually I is going to have to subsidize at least in the current period, even though eventually, of course, it wins and uh, ends up extracting positive profits. Uh, all right, so let me talk about welfare. Uh, the key thing here, so the, the interesting result is that, as I mentioned, uh, given the expression of the threshold of the, the delta, basically the unique, uh, the unique mark of perfect equilibrium that I've shown you is socially optimal. Uh, because that delta is exactly the difference in present, so it's proportional to the difference in present discounted values of, uh, of the total surplus offered by each firm on its winning path. Now, at a high level, the intuition would be as follows. Well, consumers are short-sighted. They're not really short-sighted. I mean, the issue is like, again, here, consumers don't have to look beyond the current period. So they only care about, because they can either costlessly switch or they, you know, it's new consumers every period. But the firms are willing to subsidize, right? So in every period, in the current period, each firm is willing to offer as a subsidy, the present discounted value of its future profits if it wins versus if it loses. So at some high level, there's this intuition, well, if a firm can offer a higher PDV of total surplus, then maybe it should win. The thing is, it's actually not so obvious. So the, the social efficiency result in this proposition, it's actually relatively subtle and not, you know, not immediately uh, clear. The reason is uh, the winning firm, because it's competing against, uh, against an opponent who's willing to subsidize, well, obviously the winning firm is not gonna extract the full present discounted value of the surplus that it creates. And actually to see this very clearly, if we take a finite period version of our model, uh, the threshold with finite periods is in general not socially optimal. Now, this threshold, when, you know, when we take the number of periods and make it go to infinity, converges and you know, everything's consistent, converges to the, the threshold that I've shown you earlier. However, what's interesting about it, the threshold is not efficient, but the inefficiency in the threshold goes away as the number of periods goes to infinity. So it's somewhat, you know, it's somewhat interesting, somewhat, somewhat neat that this happens and not, you know, not immediately obvious. Um, and then finally, a final observation here which, uh, related to welfare is that because, because of Bertrand competition, obviously the uh, consumers are left with the surplus, with a total surplus that is offered by the losing firm. Because of that, uh, whenever the winning firm keeps, uh, keeps learning, so the winning firm keeps winning in every period and increases its learning, not only that doesn't, does not help consumers, but it is quite possible that actually hurts consumers. And the reason it can hurt consumers is that learning by the winning firm actually in some sense discourages the losing firm. So it's offering either less, uh, so it's, it's decreasing, it's the subsidy it's offering consumers, or actually it stops offering a subsidy altogether. So as a result, it becomes less, com less of a competitive threat to the winning firm and therefore consumer surplus suffers as the winning firm keeps winning. Now, what that suggests uh, is basically there might be scope here for something like a data sharing policy in order to help consumers, in which basically what you may want, what we kind of like, what we would want to do intuitively is say, well, I want to strengthen the competitive position of the losing firm or the firm that's behind. Maybe we should require the winning firm, the firm that's in front, to share its, its data or its learning with the losing firm. The idea would be, well, if we do that, then it keeps competitive pressure on the, on the winning firm and you know, it, should, it should lead to higher uh, consumer surplus. The problem with that is that there is a, obviously there, there can be a countervailing um, uh, force to this. And the issue is the following. If the, if the losing firm is E and E is behind, if E anticipates that it's going to, uh, that even if it loses, there's gonna be some data sharing from I, well, it kind of reduces E's incentive to fight very hard. And in our model, this translates into offering a, a lower subsidy. So E basically doesn't need to compete as hard because it knows it might actually benefit from data sharing. So it's a bit of a, it's a form of free riding. Now, we, can, we actually show what we do in the paper. I'm not going to show you here the details in the interest of time, but we can show this straight up formally and it comes up very neatly in the model. So basically we can, if we uh, take identical learning functions for both firms, so there's FI and FE are, are the same, and we assume that I has already reached its maximum learning threshold and E is somewhere behind. Uh, and we're gonna say data sharing means that uh, if E remains behind the end of the current period, then there's gonna be full data sharing in the sense that I is gonna be forced to share all this data to E. So E catches up no matter what at the end of the current period. Well. So that's like the simplest, simplest version of data sharing that we can look at, and we can still generate this trade-off. So basically what happens is, and this 
framework, E no longer has any incentive to offer a subsidy in the, uh, in the presence of data sharing, because it actually doesn't matter if it wins or loses, it will pull even with I. So as a result, the present discounted value of consumer surplus can actually end up being lower with data sharing because they no longer benefit from the subsidy that actually uh, creates competitive pressure on I. It's not true for all parameter values, but you know, we show that on, on the range of parameter values, this, this can happen. So um, another effect that could happen, and I'm wondering if, if, if it doesn't seem to happen in your model, but usually when you think of mandated sharing, uh, you'd expect also that the firm would have less incentive to collect data itself. So here I would have less incentive to collect data. Does that happen? So I think that so I think that's a fair. I think Jacques' report mentions that, right? And it, you have some like at, at some point with data sharing, there, there's something there. I don't, we don't model data collection. So in, in our case, I think I mean I guess you could interpret uh, the so it, it could be like efforts to uh, efforts to collect data or like investments, like at a, a, you know at a very uh, in a very but, general. But even, even with pricing, you could imagine that you would have an incentive to offer a lower price in order to generate more data, but doesn't seem to be the case in your model. Right? Well, so actually anything to do with prices, I think it's captured in our model, right? Because the, so that kind of takes, so that's taken in, so everything that has to, that goes through prices is taken into account in this framework, right? So, I mean, we do take into account that, of course, like if I lower my price, I just get more data and I accelerate my learning. So that's definitely there. I, we don't model as, a, as an investment, but I think, so this result, the fact that there's a trade-off, I think it's still true, right? I mean, you can interpret it is meaning I free ride because uh, in our case, it's free riding by no longer offering a low enough subsidy. If, you know, if the relevant variable is investment effort or investment in connecting data sharing, then you could interpret it that way as well. So I think it's pretty, I mean, that conclusion is that there's a trade-off. There's a very clear trade-off with data sharing uh, should be quite robust. Like we show it in a very, very simple way, but I think that's, that's fair. Anything else? No. All right. So I have eight minutes. So I'm going to maybe, well, actually, I think it will be fine, but let me speed up a little bit. So this was Wait, all. You, you, can do, you can do a bit more because we start late. Okay. No, it's okay. Um, all right. So this was uh, up to here. Everything was across user learning. So now I'm going to briefly show you the results for within user learning. So the model with within user, user learning is very similar. So there's two firms, same thing, competing over infinitely many periods. Now the consumers, they, because with, for within user learning, obviously we need the consumers to be the same, right? So consumers, uh, you'll see why actually in a second. So the learning functions are also gonna be the same, except that they mean something very different. So in this case, the NI, the arguments for, uh, for FI, is no longer the number of consumers that a firm has served, but the number of times a given, so a given consumer has purchased from firm I in the past. So again, within user learning, this is focusing entirely on the product gets better for me, the more I use this product. So it's no, there's no across user learning here. So we're just focusing on within user learning. And the other key assumption we're gonna make is that firms can price discriminate based on consumer's individual history, which basically means we can just focus here, the model can focus on one representative consumer. But everything else is the same. So the learning functions are the same. Uh, again, continuum of n uh, equal one consumers in every period. And the consumers are infinitely lived. And then learning functions have the same expressions and same properties. And uh, interestingly enough, so the key is uh, the main first main result is that, uh, well, same thing. We get a Markov perfect equilibrium in, each, in which E wins if the difference in standalone utilities uh, is greater than a certain threshold. And the threshold is actually the exact same threshold as the one for across user learning, which obviously also means the th that threshold is remains socially optimal here. So uh, one observation, uh, it is true that the threshold is the same. However, here it's actually a lot easier to understand why the threshold is socially optimal because the consumers are the same in every period. And because they care about within user learning, they basically they're forward looking and they think about, well, if I, you know, if I consume from this firm, this period, uh, how is that going to change my options in the next period? So it's very straightforward to see that consumers are going to look at the, look for the firm that offers them the higher the, the higher present discounted value of future of willingness to pay, which is utility plus the, any subsidy that, um, uh, that the, the firms can offer. So the logic for social optimality is easier. However, the proof, like the way this equilibrium works is actually quite, is a little bit different and requires a, 
different proof than the one for across user learning. Uh, and the key here is like because consumers are forward looking, we also need in the derivation of the equilibrium, we also need to, uh, to derive the value function for consumers. So it's not enough to just look at the value functions for the firms. That's just a technical aside. Uh, and then finally, what I want to emphasize here is that for this here, uh, with, for within user learning, the pricing or the subsidies offered by the firms are no longer the main driver. And one way to see that very clearly is that we can actually remove prices here. So we can assume that the two firms price at zero or sorry, at cost in every period, you would still get the exact same threshold. Again, this has to do with simply with the fact that consumers are just going to look for the firm that offers the highest uh, PDV of willingness to pay. That was not true. So with across user learning, I can't emphasize this more. That was definitely not true. If you remove pricing and subsidies, the, the equilibrium is going to be very, very different and it's not going to be socially optimal. Um, all right. So the, the, the other proposition that, so this, the, 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 that matters a lot here. Um, so focus on the, actually, so let me briefly talk about the first two bullet points. So just like in the case with across user learning, again, the, the threshold is the same and you still have the same uh, possibility of subsidization by the losing firm. So that doesn't change at all. Now, the interesting question is, well, because the thresholds are the same, uh, we can actually compare. Uh, so the winning firm's profits with, user, uh, with across user learning versus this case with within user learning. And as it turns out, the PDV of the winning firm's profit is actually always lower with within the user learning. Now, to understand this, again, it comes back to the fact that here consumers are forward looking. And the key difference is the following. Uh, forward looking consumers with within user learning actually understand that if they join, if they join the winning firm this period, that actually puts them, uh, so basically that means they have a higher switching cost, endogenous switching cost to switch to the loser the next period, which means they're actually, uh, the, the, the losing firm is in a, in a weaker competitive position next period, which means the winning firm can actually, uh, the winning firm can actually extract more. So as a result, the winning firm must compensate these forward looking consumers for the weakening of the competitor the next period. This was not true with the cross user learning because again, with the cross user learning, the, com the consumers had no reason to look past the current period and making their choices. So basically as a result, you get more intense competition when learning is within users than uh, across users. And obviously that means consumers are better off with uh, within user learning and counterpart to that is that if we look at the same, if we do the same data sharing exercise that we did with uh, cross user learning, when we have within user learning, data sharing is actually more likely to lower consumer surplus because you're already, it's already pretty competitive. So like actually forcing data sharing is more likely to, to harm consumer surplus than not here. All right, so uh, the next, so this is the, the thir third and last, uh, last part of the paper. We're looking at, we're gonna focus on network effects and the role of beliefs. Uh, so key observation here is that up to now, network effects have played absolutely no role in the equilibrium analysis. Again, some people may think, well, data enable learning because of this uh, positive feedback loop is a form of network effect. Again, I don't have a strong feeling, like, uh, feeling about this. But even if you believe that, uh, well, up to here, even if say like maybe there was a network effect, that network effect actually had no material implications. There, there was no consumer coordination problem. And the reason is any, in both of them, both the model with the cross user learning and within user learning, there's no reason for any consumer in making their decision to actually look at what other consumers are doing in the same, uh, in the same period. Basically all that matters for every consumer was, well, which firm is offering the highest, higher, uh, either PDV, higher present utility or PDV or future utility in this period. Now we can actually generate, so uh, we can actually generate network effects that actually lead to consumer coordination problems in this model in two ways. And I think this is interesting. It's an interesting exercise because it, it clarifies, it makes it very clear why uh, the conditions under which uh, this kind of data enabled learning actually leads to coordination issues and network effects that have, uh, you know, um, substantive implications. So the two ways are as follows. The first thing we can do is, so obviously you need, in order to get network effects, you do need a cross user learning. There's no chance we're gonna get any network effect if the learning is solely within users, right? Because then there's never any chance that a user will care about, uh, about how many other users the firm is selling. So you have to have a cross user learning. But again, that by itself is not enough. 
So we can add one of two things. We can add learning within the consumption lifetime. So as I mentioned at the beginning, a key sort of feature of uh, data enabled learning nowadays is that products improve so fast that when consumers adopt certain products, they actually fully expect the product to improve within you know, their consumption lifetime. So we can model this in two ways. Um, I'll, I'm not gonna show you the models here, they're, they're in the paper. Uh, one way is to basically say there's a cross user learning and then there's also within period learning. So we just basically add one period of learning. Uh, so the utility for a consumer uh, in the current period is, depends on how many, how many consumers we served in the past, but also depends on how many consumers are being served in the current period. That obviously would lead to network effects with coordination issues. And then the second one, which is a little bit different, across user learning, and now we're gonna assume that consumers pay once and then they can enjoy utility from the product that they've chosen over multiple periods. And in this case, basically the price ad adds, um, acts as an endogenous switching cost. And again, you, you get uh, coordination issues and proper network effects. Um, and then the second way, which we certainly think is, was the more interesting one, uh, to generate network effects with coordination issues is that uh, you can combine across user learning with within user learning. That's it. So just a bit, two basic models that I've shown you, combine them in the same model. And there what you get is endogenous switching costs due to, to within user learning. And then combine that with the fact that I have to care about across user learning actually gets uh, a very nice way of generating um, network effects with coordination issues. So Either, either, so no matter which, which of these uh, different ways of generating network effects we choose, what's interesting is as soon as, obviously as soon as you get a consumer coordination problem, you get scope for beliefs to matter, just like in traditional models with network effects. So what we do in the paper, we, we contrast uh, Pareto beliefs where basically everyone uh, coordinates on the equilibrium that's best for consumers versus beliefs that favor one firm. And then we show that there's, uh, there can be a distortion from the social optimum. So I'm looking at the time, uh, since I only have one minute, so my plan, I was gonna show you briefly what the model with the cross user and within user learning looks like. Um, let me do it in maybe like 30 seconds. Uh, so it's just, it's a relatively interesting, uh, it, it's, it's a relatively simple, but relatively interesting formulation. So what we do here is simply instead of having, so the, the learning function has two components now. There's a cross user learning that depends on how many other consumers we've served and within user learning, depending on how many times we've served an individual consumer. And again, I think the, so the, the key message from this is that you within user learning, ser the, the within user learning part cre uh, serves to create an endogenous switching cost. And then the across user learning actually creates this interdependency across different customers. Uh, let me skip the, the details, but basically the bottom line of this is that you do get a distinction depending on the nature of beliefs. So you get a different equilibrium. And then it's very, uh, the key message is that both types of learning are necessary in order to create this type of endogenous network effect. And I'm going to conclude very briefly. Um, again, I think this is uh, data enabled learning has become essential uh, to many products and services. And it does have very, uh, you know, material implications for competitive advantages, uh, for competitive advantage and competitive outcomes. Uh, you know, profits are, a, a key, I think a key message is profits are higher with a cross user learning versus within user learning. And I think this is like a relatively general, uh, general implication. Uh, there's some, again, I didn't, I didn't talk too much about comparative statics, but we do, we can actually generate some nice, interesting comparative statics uh, using uh, both general, but also like some more specific learning functions. And then the other, the last key message that I want to leave you with is that um, favorable user expectation can actually be a source of competitive advantage if we combine across user learning with either continued product improvement during consumption period or within user learning in, in order to actually for network effects to, uh, to matter. Otherwise, you know, data enabled learning may be a form of network effects, but not one that, you know, has a material implication. So I'm done. And okay. thank you for putting up with, uh, with this. Okay, thank you, Andre. Cool. So we've got a, a few questions. So what I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, give you the, I'll give you the mic. Okay, so those people who ask questions on, on the chat, so I'll start you know, from the, the first one. So Doshin, you had a question first, so I'll activate your mic. Doshin. Oh, yes, uh, so it's a very trivial question, but uh, why uh, does the loser stay in the, in the market? If, if we, there is some uh, very small cost uh, 
fixed costs to pay to stay in the market, then the loser will quit the market immediately, no? Uh, I think that's fair. So we just somehow we assume, right, you're right. So like a uh, lot lo of shortest answer is like, we don't, we don't assume that we allow the, we allow the loser to stay there. Um, trying to think, is there a more, maybe there's a, uh, there's a, um, I mean, I guess you could justify it if, the, you know, maybe there's like, they're in di so uh, there's maybe different market segments. So the, the, the competition that we model here is basically valid in one market segment and the, the, the loser still stays because it has other active segments, so it can still sustain itself. Um, now, JP, uh, just to try to uh, activate your mic. Jay, you want to say something? Sure. Uh, yeah. So my question is, uh, what if there is some some decay in in learning? In other words, the more recent the data is, the more important. So I think that's a very nice extension. So Julie and I were just talking about uh, doing this as an extension of our model, right? So you're right. As of right now, we assume that everything accumulates. Uh, I think this, so. Again, the cool thing about the model is quite tractable, and I think we can easily accommodate. I mean, we need to think about the best formulation for this, but you can make it either. I don't know some probability that in every period you lose, let's say. Uh, the last period of learning or something like that. Basically, this the stock of learning decays, right? That's what you have in mind. Is that right, JPL? Okay, uh, yes, that, that, that was my question. That, yeah, so I think it's-, it's I, so Especially a mobility data, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's, you know, I think that's very, uh, that's, that's, that's a good point. I think we're, we're gonna look at this like pretty much. It's one of the next two things we're gonna do. Okay, um, question by Fiona. Uh, if consumers are not forward looking, then how do the results change? some form of imperfection seems like it might be realistic, more realistic. If, uh, if consumers are not for, so again, in the first model, so remember with a cross user learning, the consumers don't need to be forward looking. So it's like, actually it could be either new consumer, you can interpret it in many ways actually, either it's new consumers every period, or it's like infinitely live consumers that don't actually understand what's gonna happen. But either way actually, so with the cross user learning, it doesn't matter because they don't have to be forward looking. The, the only thing that matters is current period. With within user learning, uh, then it actually matters. So if they're not forward looking, I guess we can, um, so what would happen? Uh, I mean, I guess you get, a, yeah, we're definitely gonna get an inefficiency in the results. And in fact, so in the model with, within user learning, if consumers are not forward looking, first of all, we're not gonna get uh, the social optimum and presumably gonna get the same type of inefficiency that we would have gotten in the model with the cross user learning if there were no prices. I mean, that's, yeah, that's easily, easily addressed. Okay. Um, Luis Cabral wanted to ask some questions. Luis, I'll give you the mic. Right, I actually had a couple of questions, a very small, more detailed question and then a big picture kind of question. Small detail sure. is I couldn't quite understand why if I'm a, a, a multi-period consumer, forward-looking consumer, I do not care what other consumers choose in the current period. Um, uh, Luis, in which, so I, I'm happy to go back in, to this. In the which cross, cross learning, I mean, in the, in the cross learning, I mean, the, in the uh, uh, yeah. uh, internal case, that's uh, in the cross learning case. I, I thought that I'd mentioned that um, there were no network effects within period uh, That's right, and I couldn't understand why not. Uh, if I'm a forward look, if I, yeah, if I'm a repeat cons uh, consumer or whatever, long live. Right. So th in this model, so let's say with the cross user learning. So what's happening? Your utility depends. So it's standalone value plus the value of learning, the value of past learning. So again, here we don't, we, we assume that there's no within period learning. So basically, all the learning that's relevant for today's customer. It's just the learning that occurred up until the, to the previous period, right? Now, it is true that the product can still improve in the future, right? So if I buy, you know, I, if this firm wins and I keep buying from it, I'm going to get higher utility. But the key here is like, you don't have to worry about this when you make your choice today because you can costlessly switch. So all that matters to you, like if I'm looking at today, today, the utility that matters to me, so uh, the only learning that matters to me is the learning that occurred in the past. I'm going to basically get the utility that is based on learning that occurred in the past, whichever firm I choose. 
then I can, then tomorrow I can I can revise my decision, and because of that, I don't have to worry about what other consumers are doing. I, I still don't get it. I mean, the fact that I can costly switch does not mean that I don't care about different states in the future. You don't have to again. So it's it's so maybe the other part is like the consumer. The consumers are atomistic, so you, like your choice, like your individual choice as a consumer here, does not affect the outcome for the next period. So whatever I choose, whichever firm I choose in this period is not going to affect who wins this period or in the next periods. It really, like it really, in this case, it doesn't matter. Like you make your choice this period, you're going to derive the utility, which is based on learning from the past. And mm -hmm. then, again, you, and then comes tomorrow, you can, I can switch firms. Or I can stay with the same firm. You just don't have to worry. Like you don't have to worry about that. So basically maybe another way of putting it is your options tomorrow like the, the, the utility options you have for tomorrow are not going to be affected by your choice today. I get that. What I don't get is that my, maybe I got it wrong, that my utility does not depend on what a measure of other consumers do today. Because again, so this, is, uh, maybe I should have made it clear. The learning, if you look at, the, at this bullet, right? So the learning, the NI that matters for the utility today is up until yesterday. No, no, no. I understand that my utility today does not depend on what a measure other consumers do today. But okay. my future utility does depend on what a measure of other consumers do today. That's right. And you can react to that. So the, the thing is, again, remember utility accumulates. So that, that's, the, so that, then, that, that's actually really simple. You're, because so whatever you do today, like you can basically wait and see. You don't have to like guess what other people are going to do today because you can just wait and see. What they're, so what's going to happen is, of course, what they do will, will matter to you, but I don't have to try to guess it. I don't have to, I don't have to make any, like, any guesses about that because that doesn't influence my current choice. So this is like a model of network effects with uh, lag network effects, like as in- uh, Exactly, Nipple, yeah, kind of, right. Nipple, so what happens, uh, just to, yeah. so what's, what's cool about this, so again, this is why like when I go to, uh, to actually generate proper network effects with expectations, well, obviously what I can, so one easy way, and I'd say the, less, the least interesting way is to basically say my utility today depends on learning up until yesterday, but it's also going to be affected in real time by how many consumers adopt in the current period. As soon as you do that, then you have to form expectations. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to take a little more, more time, but my bigger picture question is, uh, how is this really different from a learning? How is data different from a, just a traditional uh, learning right. in terms of dynamics and, and welfare analysis? All right. So, I mean, a couple of things. I mean, obviously there's some similarities. So I'm sure like there's, there's probably like a, a way to sort of like map the, so the, the pure across user learning case, the one that I started with, um, yeah, that probably maps relatively nicely at a high level with uh, you know, the traditional model of learning by doing in which it's cost that decreases as opposed to willingness to pay increasing. Now, as soon as we add uh, uh, learning within a consumption lifetime or within user learning, things become very different because this is something that was not there in traditional learning by doing models. Uh, the other thing I would say is that uh, because the way we formulate it, you know, relative to traditional models, I guess relative to especially your paper with uh, uh, with Mike Riordan, uh, we can also get uh, so actually we get closed form solutions. We get full characterization of the of the price dynamics. We can also do I guess some comparative statics on the on the learning functions. But more substantively, I think it's you know we can look at across user learning versus within user learning. We get the role of beliefs and actual network effects that are, that are being introduced in the mm -hmm. model in various different ways. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, now we have a question by Özlem. I'll activate the mic. Okay, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask, so you said that firms can price discriminate based on history in the between user learning case. What if they so, can't- like, Sorry, Özlem, sorry can, you, can you repeat that? Uh, I, I didn't get the first part. Uh, in the within user case, within mm -hmm. user learning, firms can price discriminate based on history Yep. What if they can't price discriminate perfectly? Uh, so that's a good question. So basically the reason we need this in some sense is that, uh, because there, what, ha what happens if you can't price discriminate, then it is conceivable you'll get a pretty complicated, uh, might get a more complicated analysis in which some consumers have, like different consumers have bought a different number of times from the two firms. So you can't rule that out, right? So you might actually get non-existence of, a pure strategy pricing equilibria in every period, which makes things, you know, very, very messy. 
Okay. And, and, and obviously you can justify, sorry, just one, as so I would say, you can easily justify this, right? I mean, the whole point actually of uh, within user learning of gathering data is that, well, firms actually can offer, uh, you know, can customize the offerings to, 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 to different consumers. Okay. And, and actually in practice, they do this. They offer, they can, they can easily say, okay, well, show me that how many times you bought from me and I, I'll give you a discount or something like that. I mean, it's true, but uh, you can also imagine that there are some users that firm can do this better than the others. For instance, some new and old users at the same time. Yeah. So I, I totally agree. So, I mean, that's honestly, I think that's probably like an interesting extension. I think, you know, what, what there, like you have to, you get into like more complicated pricing issues. So there may be, again, because users have different histories, you might get it. You might actually have to get into like a uh, mixed strategy pricing equilibrium. Again, could be could be an interesting extension. Next question from Chiara Faronato. Uh, hi. Uh, yes, my question is more on uh, whether we can translate some of the learnings of these models into an empirical test of which uh, type of learning matters more more across different industries, because your implications are sort of similar for within and across uh, yeah. user learning, but they are not identical. That's right. So, I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting thing to think about. So empirically, I guess, what would we, uh, I guess, let me go to, um, let me go to conclusions. I uh, can think a little bit about like what, what you could test for, like in terms of main differences. So I'd say, so the main difference to us, if you look across, uh, across user learning versus within user learning, is that competition is fiercer when there's more within user learning and yeah. profits of the firm should be lower. I think that can, that should be, I think that's sort of like the key implication, which presumably, I mean, you're, you're much better at this than, than I'm like, you might think about like taking this to the data and try to find a way to, well, to test for that. Right. Yeah. There's no sort of direct implications of, of sort of earn entry uh, or so we don't have, I mean, that's a good question. We don't have, I mean, here it's like the, the entire model two. is, yeah, yeah the duopoly is two firms. We don't, we don't have yeah. entry here. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks. But I think that's, by the way, that's actually an interesting, uh, so again, there are other papers. I mean, Alex has a current paper. There's a couple other papers. They're looking at different aspects of data enabled learning. I think it would be kind of interesting to, so we haven't seen this distinction like between across user and within user learning. I, we haven't seen this anywhere else. So I think it's one of the key novelties of this paper. I think there's probably ways to combine this with maybe a model of entry, right? We have multiple firms and there's like entry and exit of firms and see what, what I mean, presumably that, that will matter there as well. So that might also lead to other important empirical implications like that. Ben Kastner has a question, Ben. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so you had this data sharing result that um, yep. in a lot of circumstances ended up being negative for welfare when you have total data sharing. Um, so I was wondering if uh, partial data sharing is more broadly helpful, basically letting the entrant catch up, but not too much. Uh, conceivably, but I mean, the, the, I think the, the thing is that the, this trade-off will still remain, right? Unless you can find the way, I mean, I don't think it's obvious that more partial or like less data sharing necessarily means less free writing. I mean, the free writing is there. It's a matter of like which data, I mean, what you would want is like, I want, I want data sharing that minimizes free writing and maximizes the, um, I would say the competitive pressure that you put on the leading firm or on the winning firm in order to have the highest chance of, uh, of, uh, of making sure that it doesn't harm consumer welfare. So I'm not sure that it's just, it's just a matter of making the data sharing partial. Like free writing is always necessarily going to happen. Okay, um, so there, there's another uh, question on, on Cabral and, and Riordan, but I guess this has already been uh, sort of discussed. So uh, the last question is um, by Jacques. So that's a way to close the loop. Jacques, can you unmute yourself? Or... Jacques, you promised you would not talk again. <laughs> Let's see. Jacques. Okay. Oh, yeah. Jacques, you still here? Yeah, yeah I couldn't have been myself. Uh, 
No, this is really interesting. Uh, one of uh, the big issues in uh, policy is uh, uh, the question of uh, uh, fir multi-product firms in the case of data. I mean, people are very worried about, and you know, we speak uh, quite a bit about it in our report. I, I mean, one, can, one could see that in your, uh, we could extend your model in order to uh, take into account across product learning. Uh, do, you have, uh, do you have any idea what would happen? In particular, I wonder if your results on uh, you know, the effects on competition uh, wouldn't be at least partially reversed. Uh, if you were so which, which ones you mean? The comparison between within user and across user learning? Yeah, and the fact that uh, uh, letting uh, data sharing would reduce the intensity of competition. Uh, oh, I see. Oh, I see. Use the data in one product, but not on the others. And I think, from a, a policy viewpoint, it would be really interesting to try to uh, extend your model in that direction. So, I, I absolutely, short answers. I absolutely agree. We haven't done anything in terms of. So, this is obviously within the same product. Um, I mean, I think high level, you probably will still have some sort of like. There's still going to be some sort of free riding. Uh, but I'm sure there's some interesting novel effects, right? Like when you think about data sharing across multiple products, right? I mean, does that, I mean, there's an interesting question, like does data sharing when it's across, so in this case, there's no question. Well, actually, no, even here, right? I mean, what's interesting, even if it's within the same product, data sharing has, well, it can intensify or it can, uh, or, or a competition where it can make it less, less severe. I think it's, in, I mean, it, presumably it's even more complicated when, you, when it's across products, like whether data sharing is pro or, uh, I mean, I guess this is something Alex, uh, Alex and Greg look at in their paper, whether data sharing is pro or anti-competitive depending on, uh, Alex, do you, do you guys have, uh, uh, so you do have something on mergers, right? Data-driven yes. mergers, presumably yes. is data in different markets? Yes, yeah, uh, data is generated on one market and can be used in another one. So I think maybe that's a more suitable framework for, uh, for addressing that. I'm, I'm sure you can take some, like you can take hours and, and extend it to multiple, pro uh, multiple products. We haven't looked at that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and so th there are two, uh, two last questions. So uh, this one by like some, yeah. One, one thing as also like the co-organizer of the seminar. So I don't know, I think we may, I, I would love to answer more questions, but we may also want to send a strong signal of like being on time. Although I guess the, the, the good thing here is that people have the option of dropping out. So that's what I was going to say. People can leave. So, okay. Then everyone, well, thanks everyone who was here all the way up to now. If you want to drop out, you're more than welcome to. I'm happy to stay until we exhaust all questions. Okay, so there's another question from someone whose name, unfortunately, I can't pronounce. Um, you can't read. <laughs> I can't read those, those characters. Korea, is it Korean? I saw them. Uh, yeah, I've, I haven't muted you. Um, and I can't even address that person. Uh, hello? Okay. Okay, so in the meantime, Jay, uh, oh, it's Yossi, okay. <laughs> so Yossi, I haven't muted you. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, hi. Yossi. Yeah. So, so my question was about the precise relationship between uh, across users and within users. Uh, so if I understood correctly, uh, in the within users model, expectations matter because uh, if I join uh, one of the providers, then uh, I, I, I learn, but if somehow I switch, I lose the learning. Is that the idea? So even with, within user learning, you do not have to form expectations. It's basically, it's forward looking, but with, obviously with within user learning, I, with pure within user learning, I don't care what other people do. I just have to basically uh, look at the present discounted value of utility offered by each firm. I don't have to form expectations about how many other users are going are gonna to use each firm because it doesn't matter to me. The only thing that matters is how many times I use the same firm. Of course, the key is once I combine, and this is like, I can't emphasize this enough. What's cool about this is like once you combine within user learning, so within you, only across user learning, no network effects. This is, was the discussion with Luis earlier. 
within user learning, perhaps even more obviously, no network effects. You combine the two, then you actually get a network effect, which is cool because then you actually, yeah, you do have to care. I, there's a switching cost because, because if I make, you know, if I use a certain firm for a certain number of periods, now it's costly for me to switch. And then secondly, because there's a switching cost, now I actually have to worry about, well, how many consumers is each firm going to serve? Because that actually determines my across user learning component. So when you combine the two, yes, expectations matter and you do have a network effect. But if you just have one, one or the other, you're not going to get and expectations don't matter at all. Uh, Jay Thiel. Yes, I mean, there have been some uh, policy discussion on, on consumers having uh, control over their data. So what if a consumer can, can, can uh, bring, um, can own their own data and uh, give to another firm uh, so within, the, we, we, within the user uh, uh, right, right. framework? Yeah. So that's interesting. So I'm going back to where we discussed this, right? So uh, let me see if I can reinterpret this as some sort of form of data sharing, right? So I think the, uh, so the key message here is that, well, learning by the winning firm decreases consumer surplus. And in some sense, if you're the consumer, like if consumers could coordinate, like I know that this firm is, we know that this firm is going to win, but the problem is because it wins every period, that actually could, that can hurt us. So if we can somehow all agree well, let's join the loser for a period in order to make the loser stronger. That actually helps our surplus because we keep the, we keep the loser in play. So I think this is where you're right. There may be scope there. If consumers own their data, maybe they say, okay, I'm going to give my data to the loser or whatever, to the other firms, just to, you know, just to, uh, just to make that firm more competitive and put pressure on the winner. So in some sense, it's real, I think it's related to what we're talking about when, uh, with data sharing here. Does that make sense, JP? Yeah, yes. Yeah, so so that, that's a related question to, to data sharing. So I mean, I data guess, sharing. Yeah, I, I guess there may be an interesting question. Like, can you, because again, we modeled this as data sharing and we chose a, a, a specific form of data sharing, it's kind of extreme. Uh, maybe, so there's probably an interesting way to model this idea that consumers own, like you sort of micro found this, like consumers own their data and they can choose how much data to share with how many firms in every period. So I'm sure there's, there's probably some, some, something interesting to be done there. Uh, Jennifer has a question. Jennifer Kwan. Oh, so yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that. Thanks so much for a nice um, presentation. Um, I guess I was wondering if privacy might be a second dimension of quality. Um, and so then you might give up search result quality, your main um, dimension of quality for this second dimension of quality? So that's interesting, right. So this would be, again, would this is actually very, probably an interesting topic. It would be interesting to, to microfound this. Let me see if I can translate this into our framework, right? So here we're basically saying the more consumers you've served in the past, there's an auto, like we basically black box everything into this F, into the FI functions. And I guess what you're saying is like, if you have privacy, then maybe there's a, there's a second component. So like basically it could be privacy, but basically privacy is negatively correlated mm -hmm. to the amount of data, something like that, right? Right. Um, that could be an interesting extension, right? So maybe, again, you would have to like, just like with JP, I'm trying to think, I'm sure there's probably a very interesting uh, extension there, like a variation of this model where you can add privacy as a dimension. And then there's, uh, you can also add, Con, uh, uh, consumer choice in every period, whether to actually leave the data or like choose to not share the data or something like that. Right. And you would do that. So it actually would, would be quite interesting, especially if consumers are infinitely live because then they have to make calculations. Okay, if I share my data, will I get better quality? But then, you know, it decreases my privacy. If I share more data that actually allows the winner to extract more value. I think it's, it is quite promising to, to go in that and direction. And it might only affect one type of learning so it might only like the privacy thing might only affect the within person learning that's right oh that's a good point yeah because otherwise you're right you're right because the other one is well if it's just for other people it well in principle you don't care that's fair thanks yeah thank you gary all right so um i was rem i'm reminded by a paper by kurt taylor on supplier surfing 
so it's a RAND paper, I think late 90s, um, that consumers might have private information about their valuations and as the firm learns more, they can extract more surplus from the consumer. So think about this with the, within consumer model that you have, mm -hmm. that consumers have incentives potentially to be switching firms in order to try to hide their true valuations, even though they might be generating more surplus with the firm, That's the firm extract more of the surplus from them. And right. so I have the setup to not always buy everything on Amazon if they can personalize my pricing and buy on Amazon. Right. So I think that's a good point. So this is where we sidestepped all these issues, right? This is, uh, always them asked this question uh, by as, uh, assuming, sorry, uh, this is the, uh, the assumption here that firms can price discriminate based on perfectly price discriminate. Now, of course, if that's not true, that's another interesting dimension, right? Because consumers can try to hide, essentially. Like I can pull myself with other consumers in order to, to face a lower price or something like that. I think that's fair. Actually, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there's a paper. So when I first presented this at APIOC, uh, so I'm blanking on the name. Uh, someone presented a paper also related to data, uh, which had a flavor of what you're describing, Gary. Oh, I think Simon, sorry. It's, it's, so it's Simon, uh, Simon Anderson and a co-author. I think they, uh, they have something like that. I, I don't fully recall, but it feels like that there's, there's something along these lines across different, there's something across different products. And I, I thought it was something about uh, consumers trying to like hide behind, uh, like not re revealing their data in order to benefit from lower prices. Okay. Um, well, I think, so there are, there are no more questions on the, on the chat. Um, so thank you, Andre. Thank you all for, uh, for being here, um, for joining us today. And so the, the next seminar is going to be in two weeks, so May 5th, and we'll have We Lee from uh, Carnegie Mellon. Um, so Thanks, Alex. I this hope was to see awesome. you there. Thank you, for, thank you so much. This was a great DJing by Alex. Um, uh, if, I mean, obviously, I want to emphasize if people have comments, you know, what we could do to make it, you know, I guess more, more informative or to improve the formatting, do let us know by, uh, by email. But that was, I mean, certainly from my perspective, that was super helpful. So thanks, everyone. Okay, bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And thanks, Jacques, for organizing. Oh, As usual, thank you. You do all the work. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> bye.